Welcome back to another episode of Coffee and Coin. I have my dear friend, Stefania, on the pod with me today. <laughs> Hi, uh, I've been just looking forward to this so much. Um, do you like your nickname? Yeah, I love it. I love any nickname. You do. <laughs> you, you, lo- you love an attention. I, exactly. I love giving out nicknames. It's like one You're of, so good at it. It's one of my favorites. Like, I don't know how Steph got to Fania, but... You know, <laughs> yeah, I love it. You're very good. You have nicknames for everyone. It's it's not my strength, but people, it makes you, it endears you to people. It makes you feel closer. I just, I, I don't even care if it makes them feel closer to me. I enjoy it so <laughs> much to take whatever your, you know, birth given name was and make a version for myself. <laughs> make it your own. <laughs> so well, this episode is our Q2 accountability partner meetup. And, you know, it's funny that we do these quarterly because really we do these every two weeks when we're getting our nails done. <laughs> yes. Um, because we're, we're real life investees. We love to talk about wealth building. We love to talk about our financial goals. And we're really motivated by achieving financial freedom. And I mean, that just keeps us talking about this nonstop, which means it's always top of mind, but it's really fun to be able to do an episode. Well, really just to do one of our accountability partner meetups and then air it publicly for others to hear because yes. more women talking to their besties like investees. Yeah. So- I, I, I know. I don't know if it's like that, like this, the content, because it's so personal and so specific, is that valuable for other people to hear. But it's just the fact that we're doing this and just like an example of what it could look like with you and your investee. Totally. And then I thought because we are both so extremely motivated to build significant wealth and achieve financial freedom that we should maybe even define what that means to us. Because I know when women come into Factora, Everyone loves that term, financial freedom. It's sexy, right? It look, it yeah. sounds great. Like who wouldn't want that? But I think everyone defines it very differently. So how do you define financial freedom? That's a great question. And I love, I love this topic. I love talking about it because it does differ for every single person. It's also very specific. And so for me, it's definitely having to do with work optional, because I'll always have something in the works. There's not, I'm not going to just, you know, lounge by the beach. It's not really who I am, but I don't want to need to work. And I've, I've made it so that I don't have to work very much and I get to kind of choose what I do. So I already feel very close, very, you know, I'm, I'm on my way and it's like very in the near future. The light is bright at the end of the tunnel. What is it? What does it mean for you? Yeah, I mean, the way we define it in Factora, because I'm in charge, is the way I define it in my life. But it's that. It's when work no longer becomes an obligation, when it's only an option. And so if you define it as work optional, we're pretty much on par there. And I agree that for you, you're already so close. I mean, I remember when I met you, you were like, I want to be retired in 180 days or whatever it was. And you left your teaching job. And the first way you had defined financial freedom to me was really just schedule freedom. And you definitely have that. And you are way better than I am at not overworking. And actually, I thought it was funny. (laughs) You were like, it's not like I'm going to be lounging on the beach somewhere. No, because we're strapped in the middle of Texas. But don't (laughs) for a minute, she doesn't lay on her couch and watch season after (laughs) season of survivor when she wants to take a little breaky break which I love yes, yes same I know I've, I've incredibly I I never take it for granted for a day in my life it's like I wake up I get to do what I want I get to and when I'm working it's fun it's exciting it's with people that I really enjoy so yes I feel I could do what I'm doing right now forever but I do think that for a lot of people like the fire movement we talked about this in another podcast we did but I'm not interested in being frugal <laughs> ever. And so I am I want it to be a luxurious work optional. So, you know, I I could stop working right now and I could live for the rest of my life on what I have. I don't want to do that because I want to have things and I want to have 
break vacations and I want to go on trips with my friends and, and that it, it costs money. Yeah. Just for people who didn't catch that episode, the FIRE movement stands for Financial Independence Retire Early. And it's really a simple concept. It's all about living super frugally so that you can invest as many dollars as possible, all your dollars really, into the stock market. And then when you have a big enough lump sum in your investment accounts, you can utilize the three or the 4% rule to cast off money and the like main amount still retains because the point is that your stock market investments should be growing hopefully at around an eight percent annual rate of return but (laughs) that doesn't always work out and so i think that the fire movement while it has a cool concept we've already seen in the last few years people's valuations of those stock market assets just slice. I mean, all the tech stocks were rip roaring through the pandemic. And then there's been a correction for those and just for the stock market at large. And so I don't like counting on one strategy as my saving grace. That's the whole concept of not putting all your eggs in one basket, which if you really think about it, is the whole point of investing. Like you want to have multiple assets, not just your one primary residence to count on. Like what if it gets ripped up in a tornado? Like sure, you'll get insurance (laughs) money eventually, but now you're homeless, you don't have this asset. Like generally, I am just always, I've got some alarm bells when people are too obsessed with just one way to do something. And then- I agree. To your point, like fire- I don't want to sell all my clothes and live in one outfit and use my favorite sweater as my pillow. Like that is how frugal these people get. Yeah. There's no wrong way, but that's not the way for me. And then there was also this term called fat fire where you live a little less frugally, but even that, like I am trying to have a luxurious life. I love to commission art pieces. I love (laughs) to have fancy dinners with my friends. I I love experiences and experience costs money and I don't want to feel guilty about experiencing things while I'm young, not yes. after I've built up this lump sum. Oh, that's exactly. I And I think that's another reason why we get along so well is because we really align on that. It's like, we're not, I mean, the, the fire movement, I love that they're where, that they're focused on like a scientific way, like they have a goal, an end goal. And we we really like that because it really get, le- leads you to where you want to be. But you and I are both interested in a, a big lives and big goals. And that that doesn't really come with being frugal. But I do think that we, we also are going to build a life for ourselves where we're working on things we love. We're spending the time that we with people that we love and we have a lot of money. Yes. And then the last thing I'll say about the fire movement or just putting all your eggs in one basket is a lot of people who focus on just that one goal, like let me get a million dollars in my investment accounts and then I can breathe. They don't know how to breathe when they get there. So yes, they can achieve their goal quickly, but if you've only learned how to be frugal for a number of years, it's really hard to unwind that. So I'm trying to live luxuriously now. So I can live <laughs> more luxuriously later. I'm trying to practice my my luxury living skills. Yes, now. exactly. Yeah, instead of instead of holding back on expenses and budgeting and you know cutting cutting costs, we like to earn more, and yeah. that is something that we're both pretty good at. And and not just earn more income through working, but earn more income from our investments. Like I. I love to invest first. Investing first and foremost is my 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 favorite. And that is why yes. we are besties for the resties. Yes. And the the dopamine hit that we get, it really, I mean, we won't we won't go too deep into this because again, you know, listen to the last episode that came out or whatever episode it is, but that we we both get a, a rush from putting money into our investment accounts investing in real estate, paying off debt, like these things are exciting to us. Um, And so we like, we have the same brain wiring. Totally. That first podcast episode is episode number 133 for anyone who wants to listen to our Q1 accountability partner meetup. 
But speaking of dopamine hits, <laughs> I, I wanted to kind of set up this episode by asset class. That's how we teach it in the fact to our wealth circle. There's three main asset classes you can use to build your wealth. It's what we call paper, which is the stock market, real estate and business. But I think we should start with real estate because <laughs> before I got on this call, I was literally on the phone with my mom because she passed me a $300,000 listing in a great place in Asheville, North Carolina. Oh. And I'm like, maybe going to pull the trigger. <laughs> <gasps> Shut up. I haven't heard this. I, well, I mean, she literally emailed me three days ago and said this is off market. It comes on market Friday. I can stave them off if we can go in early from even like getting on the market. And she didn't even call me to tell me she sent me that email. So I didn't see it until this morning. And I told her, I was like, Big Red, why didn't you follow that up with a phone call? Because now this thing is listed. So who knows? Um, She's actually driving to see it right now while we're on this podcast episode. But I get such a rush from even the potential of buying an investment property in another state with my mom, which she would be able to manage it, which would be something so great for her as she phases out of her career. So yeah, you bought some real estate (laughs) this weekend, didn't you? Okay. Well, first, wait, let's stay on North Carolina. So it would be a short-term rental. So that's the thing. We would want to get something that could either be a short-term rental or could be a long-term rental for the first few years, but cover the nut. And so that's why we're looking in the $300,000 range so that I could do the full 20% without it being, you know, too much cash unloaded because you can't do 20% on $500,000 right now. No. (laughs) It it adds up. Okay. Okay, well, I'll get the all the deets and the, the link and everything from you after this, of course. But that is so exciting. I just love – I love investing in real estate to increase quality of life. That is like my thesis. It's because you want to be there in the summers. Summers in Austin are awful. It's close to family. It's beautiful. It's affordable. Like, I'm yes. A real estate agent. She's also done – property management before. So she wants to have a little extra income. So it's a, it's a win, win, win in many cases. And yeah, Asheville's not getting any less popular. So be able to get something and Steph, this was a beautiful two one on 0.2 acres with trees. That's 12 minutes from her house in North Asheville and in a walkable to coffee and cute stuff. There's nothing like that in Austin, as you know. No. So we'll that is see. so exciting. Oh, yay. Okay. This is, I'm feeling it. Yes. I just, I, well, we, we bought a house as a family business in February of 2023 and we're optimizing it now. My word of the year, optimize. It was two doors. We're turning it into three doors. Um, and so that gets us to 10 doors. And then our goal for this family business, just for the family, is 20 doors until we start, you know, taking draws. So all of that money is just being reinvested, reinvested. We're not touching any of it. And we just went under contract on another property that will be three more doors. So we're three doors closer, seven doors to go. And I think, I mean, we got six doors this year. What's stopping us from getting seven next year? So if we get seven by the end of 2024, Then we'll have 20 and then we can start taking draws from that account. I love it. So just for people who don't know Steph's whole story, um, she has a family business that she just discussed. That goal is the 20 doors so that they can be taking, what is it, $10,000 a month each? The three. Yes. Okay. And then she also has her own properties, both herself and with her partner. And then she has just friends that she's gone in on properties with. So In total, how many doors do you have? 32 doors with the ones that we just acquired. And she runs a business called Open House Austin that is all about real estate education and doing this, getting into deals, even if you don't have the full-time talent or money to acquire property yourself. Like 
Yeah. Well, how many properties do you own? Just you, yourself, Stefania? One. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one. I mean, my name is on, my name solely is on a bunch of them, but like they're, they're all partnered. So yeah, I mean, go, go, go fast together, really. And it's just all been about schedule freedom and financial freedom. I started out as a teacher. I was, I was feeling very oppressed in my schedule and my finances, just very limited. And so that lit a fire. And I was just like, I, I am going to achieve these two freedoms and I'm, I'm close, but I love, I love like the, that we get to talk about the nuances of these things because it's just, it's easy to say, I want schedule freedom. Like, no, what does that mean? Financial freedom. What does that mean? And for me, it, it has been largely through real estate. Yeah. And even what you said just then about your name is solely on a few of the properties, but they're still done in partnerships. What she's referencing is that she's got side operating agreements with other people. So there's just so many creative ways to leverage the power of real estate. And I think a lot of people think you have to have 20%, you have to have a W2 job, you have to, you know, X, Y, and Z, whatever is kind of stated out there in the ether as the right way. There's no right way to live your life. (laughs) If there was a right way, we'd all have the same job, we'd be the same. No, the spice of life is the diversity. And so you can build wealth however you want. And Fanya is really into doing it through real estate. Yes. And I think you do have to fit it to your thesis, fit it to your values. I love beautiful spaces. I love the idea of having a beach house, a lake house, a ranch, a mountain house, and real estate is a way to do that. And it also is a way to, okay, I want this membership, this gym membership. Okay. I'm not going to cut in other areas of my life. I'm going to buy a property, have Mm -hmm. it cash flow $300, and then I'm going to buy, have this, this membership at this gym or whatever. Okay, bingo. This is how our brain works. And this is why we're such good friends, because we think of it as if I want this thing and I can't afford it, what can I invest in to make it afford me? You know what I'm saying? Flip it. And I also love using one asset class to fund another. For instance, I have a rental property in Austin that we went in on with a partner. And that partnership, the portion that we take out typically covers exactly my IRA for the year. So it's like I use my rental proceeds of a property that I put zero money into. I put what equity and we lived, you know, in the the worst uh, <laughs> renovation situation ever. They had to trench the living room 15 uh. feet. I will never not have dust in some of the furniture that we had in the house, but fine, whatever. And that house pays for my IRA on an annual basis. Like how cool is that? I don't have to put money in the IRA. Mm -hmm. My rental property does. Oh yeah. Speaking of genius partnerships, I mean, you are amazing at putting things together, bringing people together, making things happen. And that in itself is a huge value. This, this came out of nowhere. This came out out of your brain. And I think that your ability to do that is why you have such an amazing portfolio. So your portfolio is how many how many doors do you have? I have six. Six doors yeah. across four properties. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And you just I mean you just started doing that not that long ago. It just it it can happen relatively quickly if you're creative. Yeah. I also have a different um goal for my houses than you do. Like you want to buy a property that you can split into as many doors because obviously more doors, more income. But I think of mine very differently. I think of mine as the college or starting of life funds for my kids. And I've only had one kid, but I've got extra houses for extra kids. And <laughs> the plan is that I, instead of having to save in a, in a 529 and hope that they go to college, which I'm not even bullish on college. I think college is overrated, but that's for another yes. time. Um, <laughs> I would rather be able to hand over an asset and they can either continue managing it. They can sell it. Like there is creativity and I really want to teach them about real estate investing, wealth building, financial management through those assets. Yes. It's different, but 
also, you know, enriching your life, making your kids' lives better. Like you're, these are, these are investment accounts essentially. They are. And I don't have to panic about, am I saving the right amount or this or that? It's like, no, I'm just, I'm happy to take appreciation. I'm happy to have long-term rentals. I'm happy to have, I mean, these, these are still very profitable, lucrative rental properties because we got in before the boom, but yeah, I am. Um, I'm not looking for a certain amount of passive income from them. I'm looking at them more so as starting of life vehicles for my kids that I don't have mm-hmm. to then save in addition to me for my kids' education. Yes, and that's why real. That's why we both love it because you can fit it to whatever your goals are. Like I just went full steam ahead, and yours is more like I don't want to spend tons of time and money on these. I don't want to spend a lot of time managing these. Are these are for my kids' futures, and that everybody can do that to specifically their own situation. Totally. Also, talking about our interests and skill sets, you are so good at <laughs> dealing with problems. Like <laughs> happily, stuff will be like falling through a floor and saying, "Oh, this is no big deal." I'm like, "Oh my god, I am still scarred from the one time I had to have a 15 foot trench through my living room." I talk about it on a monthly basis. So that's you know, cleaning up a house does not phase her. In fact, didn't you just buy basically what anyone else would consider a teardown? Yes, <laughs> yes, we bought a teardown that we're not tearing down, and that yes. is the story of our portfolio. <laughs> This is fun for her and it's a nightmare for me. So I'm like, no, (laughs) but I love turnkey real estate. Yes. Yes. Which, yeah, again, even that is, is you can, you can customize it and personalize and yeah, I'm, I mean, you can follow me on Instagram for this one. This is going to be a fun one. There's some, (laughs) it's dirty. I want to come see it. Okay. Oh yeah. So we talked about real estate for this year. What about, oh no, you kind of talked about real estate for next year. You're saying you want to get those seven doors in for 2024. Yeah. Well, for me, speaking of children, before Jake and I had kids, we would refer to them as the BAMs. I guess that comes from Bambino, which I don't really know what a Bambino is. <laughs> it's your nickname thing. You just come from, continues. But I'm like, I don't know what it, what it means. Um, <laughs> So we wanted to get into a nice house in a nice neighborhood to have our first kid. And so we would refer to that house as Bam Terrace. That is where I'm podcasting from, Bam Terrace. But Bam Terrace doesn't really fit more than one kid. So in 2024, we would like to acquire what we've been calling Bam Estate. And Bam Estate should be able to fit all kids, which if we're lucky, we will hopefully be able to have three. So... That's the plan for 2024. So saving money for that. Bam estate. Yes. Do you have a vision? Yeah. I'm sure you do. Yeah. It's four bedrooms. I think two and a half baths. Like we're getting ready to, you know, level up. (laughs) Level up, which is, I mean, you've done, you've leveled up every single time in such a short amount of time. Usually it takes people a lot longer to, to level up as much as you have. So I have no doubt. I think we've done a lot of stair stepping and we're ready to just jump a few steps up Mm -hmm. to what will fit our family. And it does mean it'll be further out than we would like to be. But even then, I'm really trying to get it to be less than 20 minutes from the east side, which means really just 15 minutes from downtown because most of the stuff we're looking at is a little south. But anyways, so that's my plan. So now let's talk about our paper assets. How are you feeling about the stock market right now? Well, I should be putting a lot more, but we just had, we just had to surprise renovate a house. And so a lot of cash went to that, which is, you know, in line with my optimization, but it was just not in the, in the plans. So that's a bummer. Um, But I'm still, I'm still investing about 20% of my salary. Um, And then obviously like that doesn't count my reinvestments into like the real estate businesses. So 20% of my salary goes into the, my paper assets. What about you? What's your, what's your savings or investing rate? My investing rate is hovering around 25%. Um, we keep that pretty consistent from our salaries as well, but then we'll do an extra pop when we can. Yeah. Um, we're able to do draws from the business and then 
but my question back to you is that 20% you're putting into paper is where's that going? Is that in 401k? Is that in just brokerage accounts? Yes. So the majority is into 401k. I'm trying, I'm, I, last year I maxed it out this year since it's, you know, (laughs) we're trying to year of austerity. Real estate's kind of weird. I've, pulled back a little bit on my 401k, but I will, I, I'm pretty sure by the end of the year, I'll have it maxed out. Um, and then at, past that, I, a couple hundred dollars a month into just like the IRA standard Schwab S&P 500. Got it. Yeah. We, we did not max out 401ks last year. That is the plan this year, but it will be, um, happening towards the end of the year. So we always take our match and a little bit more, but we'll see if we can get those fully maxed out. IRAs will be fully maxed out. And then, yeah, we have automations that happen every month to our brokerage account. And that is actually the surplus from our rental income from one of our properties that goes into that account. Amazing. So that's just how we do it. And then if there's so good, we'll, we'll put more in, but usually we, we pad that account just for house emergencies. Um, What kind of IRA do you have? I have an IRA with Schwab. So we moved everything to Schwab recently so that we could have like full access over each other's accounts. I, I do something really boring. Also S and P. Well, but do you, are you, don't you make too much money to, to contribute to a traditional or Roth IRA? No. So I make too much money to contribute to a Roth IRA, but anyone can contribute to a traditional. I see. Okay. Yes. Yes. So the Roth is the up to a certain income limit. It's usually around 123,000. And then if you make more than that, there's another bracket where you can't contribute the full amount, but a portion of it. Yeah. And Roth just means that things are taxed going in. Traditional means things are taxed coming out. So anyone yeah. can see the traditional. I'd have a traditional, but I have been focusing on other things, but I should, I should go back. Yeah, it's, it's worth it. And I still That's have my Roths so that'll sit there because those went in free tax. And so they'll come right. out with no more taxation from Uncle Sam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have one from teaching too. So, but I, it's, it's so good to just like check back in on those things and make sure that everything's being invested because we've heard horror, the horror stories of the, of the years of investing that we're just sitting in a market, money market account. That is the story of <laughs> 25% of women who come into the wealth circle. Uh- I've been so excited to get investing and proud that they have retirement accounts set up. But when they actually look into what those accounts are invested in, they are oftentimes not invested, which is like yeah. just so painful because <laughs> they've probably so been a few years and they're not gaining. I don't know where this is, where this should fit. I think maybe in paper, but I just classically always stretch myself as you know, like so hard. I guess this is not on the same vein, but I do, we bought our estate last year and uh, we, it's over a million dollar home. Love it. It's amazing. It's the best. However, we took a HELOC out, which I love. We are going to have this HELOC for 10 years. We have access to it and that's our emergency fund. But we did spend a lot of it on our down payment for this house. And so we're just like, yeah, we're, we're trying to pay that back. So right now, one of my big goals for paper HELOC emergency is to pay this HELOC down aggressively. What is the rate on it? Is it variable? It's variable. So right now we're hovering in like the 7%, mid sevens, which is definitely not ideal. Um, but we're just we're just like throwing as much money as we can, which is why our our paper, our investment rate is down a little bit. And like my 401k is not getting priority. Yeah. And I'll just break that down for listeners. So if in that example I gave, and we use these examples in the factorial wall circle, if you have money in your stock market market accounts and they're properly diversified and they're, you know, planning to be allocated there for a long time horizon, typically you can see an 8% annual rate of return. And so if Steph is dealing with a HELOC where she pulled money out of her house and she has to pay that money back that's sitting at 7%, you can see it's the differential there is not very good. So it's like pay that off so that you can go back to stock market investing where instead of paying the 7%, you're earning the 8%. 
Yes. So that's, that's really, I would say that's the thing that um, most people are confused by because they don't look at their financial life holistically. They kind of just look at this. I have this one loan. I have this one retirement account. But really, you got to look at it as one big pie because there's no point in taking a slice over here if you're not getting it back over here, right? I don't know right. if I explained right. well. I think so. I think it's it's more of just like really analyzing what you, what you just said, what the return will be if you put this money here versus what are you paying over here. So and like instead of just you know piling on the stock market, I'm diverting those funds to pay down this this strategic debt, um, but still debt that's, you know, costing me money to have out. So and that's the other thing that women learn that I don't think that we're ever taught. So of course, it makes sense that it kind of hits you over the head when you finally open your eyes to it. But when you are paying any sort of liability, it's typically compound interest, right? So we know credit cards are around 20 to 25% interest. You just heard me use the 8% example with the stock market. You're never going to get 20 to 25% necessarily on a like low key, easy investment. I mean, Steph does, but that's because she's punching equity into these houses. She is right. literally taking them from tear down to beautiful again. And it's a lot of work. Yeah. The stock market can be so passive. You can kind of set it and forget it and just make sure it's properly set up. And so, you know, if you don't really understand how interest like you want compound interest working for you, not against you. And I think a yes. lot of people don't really recognize that those two things are happening at the same time. If you are carrying a balance on a credit card, or if you have, even in your example, a HELOC at around 7%, but you're not strategically paying it off so that you can get back to investing somewhere where you can earn a return instead of pay it out to the financial yes. institution you took the loan from. Yeah, I think that that like people are really confused about where to put everything, but paying your credit cards is definitely priority, priority, priority. Um, getting that employer match also priority. So I think you could do those two things tandem. Like you don't leave money on the table in your employer four hundred one k, but also heavily, heavily credit card debt is priority over everything else. Yeah, credit card debt's really bad. Um, and and to your point about don't leave money on the table. Um, I think people throw around that term a lot too. And then they're like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> your, your 401k match is part of your total compensation. So like, if you're not taking that, you're not getting your full compensation. And yes, it's a give and a get, right? Like you only get the match if you put money in, but just put money in up to the match so that you get right. the rest of that compensation. Otherwise you're not being paid fully. Right, right. Um, okay, business. Business. Let's talk about business. So we both own some companies. Well, I only own one. You own multiple. But <laughs> let's talk about some house and Factora, who yes. are like very in tandem businesses because they're really focused on helping women build wealth. Open house to real estate, Factora, just through general understanding of these asset classes and investing and getting in financial alignment, as well as building better habits. So like these automations and these systems and getting the right accounts and making sure that the accounts you do have up are properly being utilized. So what are some of your open house business goals for this year? Yeah. So we have, we really simplified our goals this year. We have one number, which like then trickles down to the rest of like our marketing call lead goals. Um, but our, our big top line goal is $55 million in sales, which does not mean that we ourselves will be getting $55 million. It means that we are selling or, you know, helping people buy $55 million worth of real estate. Um, we did about $54 million of of revenue or of sales last year. So having a flat goal for me is <laughs> not fun. I hate it. <laughs> and, but it's realistic. The market completely turned last year and we're, you know, we're we're in recovery. I would say I think at the bottom was December. Um so I'm very hopeful. I'm not worried, but it is a challenge for me to have a flat goal. And what does that revenue then look like for open house? Because there's your agents that sell the real estate and then 
there's a commission that comes back to them that you split with them that, you know, some comes to the open house pot. Yes. So $55 million in sales, it translates to $1.7 million in, um, in top line revenue, but then half of that goes to our agents. So we'll do about almost almost a million dollars with like other little things that we have referrals stuff like that. We'll do about a million is what is exactly what we did last year. Okay, so we are in tandem again. Um, for the last two years, Factora has done a million in revenue, and this year our goal was to do one point four million. You may have heard us on a podcast at one point where we had crazy big business goals. <laughs> Steph's for open house was like. 2.5 and mine for Factor was 2 million. But, you know, what I want to be very open and honest about is it's hard to run a business. It's hard to project when the world is the world and people are in it and they feel one way and you know, <laughs> pandemics happen and then there's another way and then the stock market, blah, 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 blah. That's the point. Like you, as business owners, really as just individuals, we are trying to make the best choices we can with limited information. And so we are both super go-getters and we've had really big goals and expectations for our businesses. I think we both backed off of that a little bit. And I know for me, at least it feels really good. Like even this year, our goal is 1.4 million and it probably should have just been a million again because we are off track <laughs> and that's okay. Cause the last two years have had a lot of change in our business. We've transitioned leadership team members. I've gone on maternity leave. We brought my husband into the business, like just a lot of things moving. And at the same time, I wouldn't want anything else. I wouldn't want to work for anyone else. I really like having a flexible remote first company that offers me more of the lifestyle that I wanted. I mean, I moved to Austin, as you know, from New York, where I was so I can't think of a better word. I hate this word, but shook by the fact that people left work at four o'clock because I used to work from dawn till dusk. Like I didn't see light and I had no work-life balance. And I came from startup culture where it was like grind, everyone grind together. And we work in a we work and like just drink the beer and then drink the coffee and your stomach is turning into <laughs> acid wreck. But it'll be great because one day the company will get acquired or IPO and you'll get some diddly amount that you have to pay crazy taxes on. And we did it. Yeah. <laughs> that life. So, yeah. you know, when I started Factora, I actually thought I would go venture out and then I've completely transitioned. And I love building a family business that is a lifestyle business that allows both myself and my employees to have a lot more flexibility. And we get to do a great mission by teaching women how to invest. And we practice what we preach. Like I'm, oh my gosh, Steph, I can't tell you. I mean, obviously open house also practices what they preach. Like all of your agents own homes creatively, multiple properties, et cetera. I cannot tell you how many companies shuck a product that they themselves do not utilize. That to me is the dividing line of who you should and shouldn't work with at this point. I have talked to too many people who can spout what their company does, but they don't take part in it themselves either because they don't understand it and they're just using the blurb or they don't like it. And I'm like, no, fuck that. Like we need authentic businesses that the people who work there actually utilize the company's products or services themselves. Yes. we. It's amazing that Open House and Factura are sister, I mean, sister companies in so many ways. We met right before we start, each started yep. our companies and we are both self-funded. We didn't take any venture money. We completely built them from the ground up. They're women owned and operated and majority of the women or majority of the employees are women. Yep. Oh, yeah, the yeah. only ones who are men are our partners. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just, it's amazing. It is, I mean, it's really common in like the entrepreneurial world to be like, we need to go bigger. We need to scale and we need to get an app and we need to, you know, all of it where 
we have kind of prioritized sustainability and prioritized quality of life. And I'm so happy. And it, it obviously to each everybody's own, but it's just, it's, it feels really good. Well, definitely, you know, to each their own, to each everyone's own. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. When you said it, it sounded right, but then it <laughs> right. Um, yes. And I do think that there's been too much hype culture around starting companies that need venture backing. You know, when you get an investor involved in your business, that means that someone else has say and you don't necessarily get to action your full vision. And I think the beauty of being an entrepreneur and seeing a void in the market or having had the problem yourself and wanting to change ratios or fill that gap or offer what you couldn't find when you needed it is that you have a vision. And I don't like it when those things get detoured. And then on top of that, the expectation is to scale at all costs because the the way venture works is we have to kill, you know, as many of you as possible to make sure that the ones of you who are going to be successful gets all the money and gets to, you know, grow really quickly. And so you hear about all the Ubers and the Facebooks, and it does sound exciting. And there are so many people who create general generational wealth off these businesses, but at what cost? And I feel like no one really talks about that. Like, It's burnt out, intense, crazy. I am so happy not to live in New York City anymore. I mean, that was my whole life was just pitch competitions. And, you know, VCs are kings and you're just catering to them and trying to change your business to excite them and delight them. And then they come in and change everything that you were planning on doing anyways. And it, anyways, I don't know. I got on this diatribe. I know, but it's true. I mean, the cost, the cost is your health, your work life balance. Well, a lot of these companies fail. So yeah. what did that founder do? They took, you know, meager fifty, sixty thousand dollar salaries, probably about the whole time, worked 90 hour work weeks, and then they still didn't make it. So <sighs> you weren't able to contribute to your wealth building and personal financial gains while you were in that lifestyle. And now what happens, you know, six years later when you're spit yeah. back out where you were before? Oh my God. I know. I know. I just, I do feel so lucky to have kind of kept that in mind and, and, and had built these companies where we're also able to build our real estate b- businesses. Like we didn't have to put anything aside. You are a mom, you have your family, you know, this is, this is, we are keeping our, values at the heart of everything we're doing um, and keeping each other accountable for doing that as well, which is probably a big reason why we've been able to do this so successfully because, you know, it's easy to be like, well, I have to go and do what everyone else is. I have to go and do the venture stuff and pitch my thing. And I, you know, and we've kind of kept each other a little grounded. Totally. Well, you got any other to share? Well, the last open house thing, we're moving offices. Um, and that's really exciting. It feels very real. We're going to get a, you know, sign and all of it. Um, personal stuff. We, um, I mean, the goal for 2023 is to bring in across all of our income to bring in a million dollars. Top line. Yes. And this is you and your partner. Me and my partner. Um, just to our household. That includes fiance. my fiance. Yes. <laughs> um, and our rental properties. I'm changing from partner to fiance because you have so many partners. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but your romantic partner is the specific one between you and him, a million dollars. Yes. So his, his, he's an agent, real estate agent for open house, um, our rental properties and then my salary. So that's the, that's a personal goal. And then, um, I mean, I mean, net worth stuff. What, what, first of all, what's your personal stuff? Wait, are you on track for that? Um, I believe so with the, I mean, it'll, it'll kind of depend on what the market does as far as like his, his income goes, but yeah, our, our rentals are doing really well. We're going to optimize the property management there to keep more of that top line. Um, and then hopefully, I mean, if Alan does well, open house does well, and we can take some owner's draws. I love it. Um, what'd you ask me? Personal. 
or anything else in Factora? Um, the only other Factora goal I can think of is that we have a Rising Tide scholarship and it's a way for more women to, especially women of color, access this financial education, um, even if they don't make a high income. So to qualify for that scholarship, you have to make less than 60000 either personally or in your household finances, and um, consider yourself a woman. And I would like to find an underwriting partner for that scholarship, because if I can get someone to underwrite the program, then we can get more scholarship participants in the program. So, you know, any listeners, if you if you have a company that wants to support women and wealth building, holler at me. Amazing. Yes, please. Um, okay, then what about family? Well, uh, we have a baby that's going to turn one years old in August. And I think that we want to start trying for another baby. Oh, my goodness. So 2024 will be baby number two arrival. Hopefully. And <gasps> Bama State. So baby number two has somewhere to fit. <laughs> to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise she's going on the porch. She's going on the porch because right now we're on the floor. And you, I, I really think that I, I would like for my kids to share rooms. I think it's fun. And like my friends shared room. I'm an only child, so I didn't, but I think it's cool, but I don't think it's a good idea to share rooms when you're a newborn with a toddler. So like, you know, I need yeah. a second room for the baby. Yes. Also, Lou's room right now is quite small. Oh, it's tiny. tiny. Yeah. This house so. was so really interesting because the master is huge, but the other rooms are very small. Very, very warranted. Bama State in 2024. Oh, it's so exciting. I also want to hear about your um, word of the year update because you said it. Yes. Are you doing it? We're doing it. I mean, we, I mentioned a surprise renovation. It was just like a, pulling a sweater and unraveling or pulling a thread and unraveling the whole sweater. Um, but that property, hopefully from now moving forward, won't cost us any more large capital improvements. We also added a tiny home to that property. So that is going to be like a stellar cash flow from now on. Um, we're adding doors and just like really trying to make our portfolio work for us. Um, and then also minimizing costs on the property management side and so hiring personnel for that which is that the person starts june june 1st yay so i, I feel like you have two words optimize yes austerity i know <laughs> <laughs> i hate it <laughs> but yes i mean we're trying not to splurge too too much like we're not doing any international trips this year um which is a bummer like again i i just was talking about how much i love luxury but Sometimes you have to buckle down and any trips though. You're just not doing any international trips. <laughs> yeah. Yes, fair. We're doing we're still doing trips. But actually we might go to Mexico in August. Because August is just so awful. It is awful. I have to I have to get out of here in August again too. Yes. You. You're right. You might be in North Carolina. No, I get back in July. Oh. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. Again. And yes. you know, it might be my last margarita. So maybe we'll go. <laughs> <laughs> for a while <laughs> long ass time it's hard That's so long i can't believe it okay what about you driver's license okay so my word for the year is self-responsibility because <laughs> i'm way too dependent on my husband and so i haven't had a driver's license since 2010 i got my driver's license <gasps> it it's a long story i'll tell you offline but done Check. oh my i thought it, what I know, I know, I know, I know. Life insurance <laughs> getting signed today. My name change is official, but now I have to be really annoying and go back and deal with all of my investment accounts, change with uh, all my credit cards. I have a very, very dynamic financial life. So there's a lot <laughs> of places that's got to get changed. Yes. Um, and then the thing we haven't started yet, but we want to get going on is an estate plan. So if anything were to happen to us, having all the will ready, godparents set up, you know, really just protecting our daughter. Yeah. I love it. Um, okay. Oh, wait, wait. And my second word, my second word is ease. So oh, I, yes. you know, I'm a little bit type A, a lot of it type A. <laughs> and I'm prone to overworking, overthinking, overplanning, controlling. 
And so my second word is ease. I just want to not dry hump the world, just let <laughs> things flow. <laughs> I'm saying it here to help keep me accountable. I love it. That's so exciting. I ease, self responsibility, optimization, and austerity. I love it. <sighs> oh, God, we're at 51 minutes. I feel like we got to wrap this episode. This is okay. Been- Do you want to say net worth? Oh, well, I don't have any updates. Same, no? same. Okay. You. Listen to the last one then. Same for me. Everything's holding, holding steady. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, always, always big goals ahead. Great talking to you, Fanya. So good. Okay. Love you, Investy. Love you, Investy. Bye. Bye. If you enjoyed this episode, come join us in a well circle. It's our live online 12 week course and community where we teach you how to create a personalized financial plan alongside hundreds of other women building wealth. It will change your life and your money for good. You can apply at factorawealth.com forward slash wealth circle. That's factorawealth.com forward slash wealth circle. See you in the next episode.